name is George Mandis. I'm here today to talk about JavaScript and MIDI. Um, I want to thank NEJS for having me. Um, this has been a really wonderfully organized uh, event, and it's, it's been really fun to see the other speakers here. A lot of the other talks are kind of useful. We have talks about best practices and usability and organizational practices. <laughs> this might not be as useful. I don't know. <laughs> um, so before we get started, I'm going to just introduce myself a little bit. OK, so my name is George Mandis, like I said. Um, not the most useful talk, but I hope it will be one of the more fun talks you see today. Um, I find that it's kind of nice to humanize developers at these conferences a little bit. So that's information you can use to find me if you want to. You can just come talk to me later if you want. And I don't really expect you to take that down. I'm a freelance web developer from Portland, Oregon. Um, I've been developing for over a decade, and that feels like a really long time sometimes in JavaScript years. <laughs> Boom. Um, so like I said, it's nice to humanize developers a little bit. So I had a couple of random fun facts about me, which may or may not help you remember the things in this talk. This is my first time visiting Omaha. I don't know if it's actually fun, but it's a fact. <laughs> uh, I lived as a digital nomad for a year once in 18 different countries. Kind of an interesting story. Um, I was born in Saudi Arabia. That's a long, bizarre story. I will tell it some other time. <laughs> Uh, I once unintentionally cheated while running a marathon in North Korea. <laughs> I don't really advocate cheating, but if you're going to cheat, I would suggest being a little more selective with where you end up doing this. Um, and, you know, as I said earlier, there's a lot of really, like, wonderful, accomplished speakers here who have interesting things. As a freelance developer, looking back at my body of work, I think my most known thing is a very silly open source project called Konami.js. I, I ask this every time I do this, and I once got a couple hands. I'm curious, has anyone heard of this project? Oh, there's a few. OK, there we go. It's a very, it's a very frivolous JavaScript project I've had for over eight years, and it feels fitting to mention here just because this is sort of a, a frivolous talk about fun, interesting things we can do with JavaScript. This seems to be the theme to my career, I guess. Um, oh, and I have a couple screenshots. My theme is KonamiJS once broke Marvel.com for about five minutes. And Newsweek.com used it to change all their articles if something to do with zombies. So that's my, uh, those are my bragging rights <laughs> right there. More relevantly, I like to make things. I, so we're talking about JavaScript and MIDI today. I'd like to see a quick show of hands. Who, who thinks they know what MIDI is or has heard of MIDI before? OK. Well, maybe half. One of the things I like to do is I like to take a, a, a tool in my tool belt, and I like to learn how to use it, and then I like to see how I can bend it and do strange things with it that it was probably not intended for. And that's kind of the theme for this talk. MIDI is a music protocol, as we'll discover. And what's interesting is, I mean, it's been around for a long time, but we can, it's not too hard to repurpose MIDI for very non-musical things, as we'll demonstrate and talk about. So I'd like to actually start with a little experiment here. Um, if anyone, are there any laptops out there? Does anyone have one handy? Couple handy, maybe. Okay. I, I'm going to throw a little website up here. I don't know if you can read that, but if you could open that website up, preferably in, in Chrome. Yeah. So if you could pull that up, that'd be great. And maybe turn up the sound also. Oops. In your um, computer. Oh, we got five people. That's enough to make some music. Okay. So I just want to do a little interactive demo using WebRTC and MIDI and Web Audio, kinds of fun, fun stuff here. Let's see. Okay, maybe it's not going to work today. Let's see. No, I don't hear. Is anyone hearing anything? Nope. Well, well that's bad. I'm just going to move on, I guess. Well, what was supposed to happen is I was playing notes up here, and I was going to get the individual notes playing on the keyboard. I've had this work at all the other conferences, so I don't know exactly what's going on. I apologize for that. Um, let me move on. I have a second demo. I, I don't know if I really given how that first one just went. I, let's do it. OK, I wasn't going to, but that's enthusiastic. So <laughs> if you wouldn't mind pulling up this website, let's try a second demo. It's a little bit similar. It uses WebSockets instead of WebRTC, a little bit of support. So maybe that'll help the situation. So I'm going to click on this. OK, we've got 38 people. That seems like, that seems unlikely. Or maybe it's <laughs> All right, so I'm going to click Start the Symphony. That's more than enough people. You're not all going to hear something, I apologize. So what it's doing right now is it's taking a MIDI file, and it's splitting up all the different parts of a song 
and each one of you is gonna get an individual part of that song, and if it works correctly, they should all start at the same time. We should get like a little symphony happen. Although I'm not super optimistic, I won't lie. <laughs> Mm, I don't think that was it. <laughs> I thought I heard something. No, did I miss it? Yeah, yeah, are we getting some? Are we getting some in that corner? Okay. Okay, this is actually the largest room I've done this in. I'm now realizing this is not working at all in a room this big. <laughs> in a much smaller room with like 20 or 30 people, you can, you can definitely tell. Uh, I tell you what, if you're really interested in this, I'd be happy to go like in the other room next door and we can try to make this work in a smaller setting. Cause I, it, Oh yeah, wait. Uh, it is, yeah, it is dependent upon the internet. Oh, almost certainly, yeah. I broke the cardinal rule of like speaking. I depended on the internet for something. <laughs> it was worth it. All right, well, so here's what we're talking about today. <laughs> we're talking about JavaScript, obviously it's a JavaScript conference. We're talking about tiny computers. Uh, like Arduinos, Raspberry Pis, Esperinos, those sort of things. I find those really interesting and kind of a fun sort of um, thing to combine with JavaScript and MIDI as far as making standalone interesting projects. And we're talking, of course, about MIDI, the Musical Instrument Device Interface. Uh, so what, why JavaScript? Um, this, you know, JavaScript is everywhere, for better or worse. It's, it's on clients, it's on servers, it's on hardware. It, like, you find bots, you can find, I mean, everything these days um, is written in JavaScript. And um, it, it's basically, I mean, it's basically everywhere. I, I teach a boot camp back in Portland, Oregon, and I have a lot of people that have never programmed anything in life, and we start with JavaScript. We start with exploring some of the basic programming principles, and I tell them, you know, I don't know where it's going to be like 10 years from now. You may have to learn. It's very likely, almost certainly going to change in your lifetime, but JavaScript is not a bad place to be today. Um, and it's, it's where the people are. Um, the other thing I tell them is, you know, whether or not you think it's, whether or not, depending on how strong your opinions are about how JavaScript should be written or what it should be doing or other aspects of the code itself, it's where everybody is actively making things, so you have to be there. Um, it's, okay, more relevant to this talk, it's a synchronous, Nature <laughs> is a very natural thing the way MIDI wants to work. So MIDI is a, a protocol for musical instruments to talk to one another, basically. And it was designed to be asynchronous long before JavaScript was even a thing. It was invented in like 1983. And so working with MIDI in JavaScript feels very natural, the callbacks and whatnot. Uh, it, it just it doesn't require a lot of, it doesn't look very different than your normal JavaScript code. So why tiny computers? To be perfectly honest, I probably could have given this talk and just focused on JavaScript and MIDI, but I really like tiny computers. I think they're, I think they're strangely empowering. They're sort of the hardware like answer to the open source movement in some ways. Um, you know, and um, it's also sort of an interesting way to sort of dip your toe into like the Internet of Things, as we'll we'll talk about here. Also, just to be clear, what I'm talking about when I talk about tiny computers, uh, microcontrollers, and whatnot, I'm talking about these guys. Um, chips. Uh, has anyone heard of chip computers? Who's? Okay. I, I really like those, and I always like them. They seem a little less known than the other ones, but I, I think they're fantastic. They're, I recommend them highly. Um, and uh, Esperinos. Uh, this little clicker I'm using is actually an Esperino. It's a puck. And I've programmed it to actually be a MIDI controller that's controlling all of my slides and whatnot, as you'll see here later. Um, so I think these are a really just fun way to extend the ways we can interact with JavaScript and MIDI and make fun things. Oh, by the way, at the end, I have a website that has links and things to a lot of the stuff I'm talking about, so don't worry too much if you're not catching it or writing it down or want to remember it later. It's, it's on the last slide. Arduinos, Raspberry Pis, Chips, Esperinos. So why MIDI? That's a little more interesting and maybe something you know less about. Um, so what is MIDI exactly? Um, like I said earlier, it stands for the Musical Instrument Device Interface. It is a protocol invented in 1983 to make electronic musical instruments talk to one another. Um, it's also a standard. 
Uh, so, you know, the way that they talk to one another involves bits and bytes and signals. What those bits and bytes and signals actually mean is decided by the standard. So all of the major electronic music companies back in the 80s got together and decided, okay, we need a way to make our devices communicate with one another. This is how we're going to communicate a, you know, a note being on. This is how we're going to communicate a note being off, et cetera, et cetera. Um, it's also a file format. The reason I have this slide and I talk about that is because when I say, oh, I'm doing a talk on MIDI, everyone's like, oh, I know MIDI. But MIDI is really a lot of things, and so I, I need to sort of point that out. It's, um, if you're a child in the 90s like me, you grew up making websites and doing stuff on the internet in the 90s, you might think MIDI is synonymous with stuff like this. Just <laughs> For whatever reason, Windows 95 uh, came with a bunch of like chintzy MIDI files on it, and so when I was growing up, I just sort of associated MIDI with like really crappy sounding music I could play on my computer. I didn't really know what else it was, and, and I find a lot of people today still kind of just assume that's what it is. And I have a few more, just to... That one's pretty good. <laughs> and uh, one more. This one's like kind of infamous, I guess. Brian Orr was an intern at Microsoft, and he was asked to write this song and never got proper credit. You can find a blog post about it out there. It's kind of funny. <laughs> that, that's like a funny intern to ask. Could you write a song for our operating system? Okay. Uh, so, MIDI the protocol, like I said, allows musical instruments to communicate with another. Um, it's a two-way protocol, so we can, just as like this keyboard I have up here on my screen, just as this keyboard can send signals to my computer, I can also send signals back to it. Now, depending on the device that I'm using, it may or may not do anything with those signals, but it's a two-way two protocol. Um, it, uh, it, so it's a way for instruments to communicate with one another. It also it describes what's happening. It describes certain types of events based on the standard, like I said earlier. So they decided that a certain combination of numbers will mean that this note is on, or another combination will mean this note is now off. Uh, and if you're, if you're a musician, that concept makes sense. Even if you're not, you can probably follow that. And the, but the MIDI standard basically outlines uh, hundreds of other scenarios that delve into the minutia of like electronic music and, and, and how to control an instrument. Um, and that's, so that's where MIDI standard comes in, the MIDI association. Uh, what's interesting about this is the way the standard is decided and the way it's maintained even today is not terribly dissimilar to how standards are sort of managed in our industry, which I think is really interesting. There are like offshoots of the MIDI standard. There are like arguments over <laughs> what things should represent. It's kind of interesting, even though the, you know, the protocol, I mean, the standard itself is a relatively simple thing. And it's also a file format. That's the other thing it tends to be synonymous with when I talk about MIDI. Uh, and a, a, a MIDI file basically just describes MIDI events and in a sequential way, like basically which MIDI events should happen when in a particular sequence. The analogy I like to come up with is it's kind of like a piano roll. Um, or Guitar Hero is probably a much more modern <laughs> reference. <laughs> um, or actually, well, I actually have a slide that's kind of like that, something like that. That's, a, that's sort of a MIDI file visualization. This is which notes or which events should happen when, for how long, what those events should be, and then how those are interpreted comes up to the software that is reading the MIDI file. Uh, so why am I talking about MIDI? It's like it's asynchronous, like JavaScript, which is kind of fun. It talks to hardware, which is interesting. Um, and it's really easy to use for non-musical applications. Um, oh, yeah. forgot I had this part. JavaScript, the Internet of Things, yay. Here's the most cool part, and the part that you can actually like, go home and actually use if you're intrigued by any of this. Uh, Chrome speaks MIDI. I have all these MIDI controllers up here on my, on my little podium plugged into my computer, and Chrome can speak to those without any extension whatsoever. Without even, I don't even have to download a special library. It's not a particularly tricky um, way to interface. Um, and so by extension, so does Chrome OS, so does Chromium, Electron. Um, basically, I can, you know, there's like hardware out there today that you can go buy, plug in your computer, and now you can start creating interesting interactions with your web pages and your projects. And I think that's really cool. Really cool. Uh, I pulled this up because I thought it was funny. According to uh, Can I Use, it has 59%, I can't quite, or no. Yeah, 59% global support, which is 
useless, but funny. Uh, <laughs> so how many musicians are in this room? I'm curious. Okay, so I'd say like a fifth, maybe a quarter, I don't know. Um, so one of the fun things about MIDI is that there's a variety of hardware. You can go buy hardware made in 1983 and buy a little adapter, plug it into your computer, and probably will know how to talk to it today. Like the standard hasn't changed. I mean, the only thing that's changed is the way you plug it in. 1983. Um, so there's like a world of interesting hardware that already exists that you can start interacting with. And that's why I like to tell people it's a really interesting way to dip your toe into the internet of things. You know, so people are put off by yeah, breaking out the breadboard and soldering things. And I totally get that. Like, it's a little bit of a barrier to entry. Sometimes you just want to like, I want a button over here that I push and it sends an email or, you know, something goofy like that. I want to be able to play with stuff that way. And with MIDI, we have now a way to talk to existing hardware to enable those kind of interactions, or maybe something more interesting than what I just said. Uh, and you can build your own, that's right. So there's like different layers of like, like you can do that and there's a relatively low barrier to entry or if you really want to it, you can you know, go and get an Arduino and get that breadboard and start soldering things together and create your own really strange, elaborate MIDI controller. So I just wanted to show you some examples of MIDI controllers up here. There are keyboards like this one, which I have up on my stage. It's a piano basically, as you can see. This is actually the first commercial uh, keyboard that supported the MIDI protocol, the Jupyter 6. Um, we have a um, different sort of interface. So this one's got little pads. I've got this one up here also on my podium and dials that we can turn. Um, those pads are also velocity sensitive so I can sort of interact with how hard the buttons are pressed. Uh, you know, this is an interesting controller because it allows for um, different, you know, different ways to interact on that front. Um, I've got this one down here on the stage, which I, you know, set up to control my slideshow a little bit. And some other things later on, as we'll see. Um, I left that one at home because it's really heavy. <laughs> uh, expression pedals, which if you're not a musician, may not make any sense. They're usually used to regulate like volume or something while you're playing music, but it's basically like a dial for your foot on the floor. Um, this one is breath controlled. You can hit the buttons. Uh, it's basically like a like Star Trek flute or something. <laughs> uh, but that's like you know another interesting piece of hardware that's already out there that you could plug in today, have interact with your browser, and make interesting things. Um, this one, I've actually got this one in my hand right now. This one is basically an accelerometer that translates the X, Y, and Z coordinates to um, uh, MIDI signals, and so you can do some interesting kind of fun things with that. And then you can also build your own, like I said. This guy, <laughs> who knows who this guy is? I'm curious. A couple of people. Yeah, basically he built his own crazy MIDI instrument back in the 80s. And I, I added the slide the other week because I remembered him and I thought that was kind of funny. And you can build your own. Here's one that someone else built that I had at home. And I made a little video of it. The only reason I did not bring this one to play with is because I dropped it and it broke, which is really kind of sad. I know, okay. <laughs> and I just have a very simple demo I made at home, uh, just showing a two-way interaction. I hit the buttons, they light up on the little screen I made. I click on the buttons and turn them off. I was just sort of playing around with it, getting to know the controller, how I might be able to make interesting things with it. So let's talk about what a MIDI message actually is. Um, I know that magenta color is kind of hard to read, isn't it? Oh, well. So I'll, I'll be kind of quick about it, but a MIDI message consists of three bytes, basically. Yeah, three eight-bit bytes. There are only two types of messages. Uh, the status message begins with a one, and all the other ones begin with a zero, the other two. Um, the status message basically explains what kind of signal it is. Like, are we playing a note? Are we turning it off? Are we doing some other kind of interaction with the instrument? Um, and the other ones describe further in depth like details about that interaction. So if I'm playing a note, which note am I playing and how hard am I pushing the button, for example. Also to be clear, you can play with MIDI and not know any of this. It's really kind of irrelevant almost to like experimenting with, with hardware and, and this protocol. So we get seven bits left for bytes. Um, and I'm gonna go to the next slide because it demonstrates all the text I threw in here a little bit more clearly. Oh, and then here's an example of how those, how the, the MIDI standard maps to that protocol I just explained. So it 
these are the, uh, like what the MIDI protocol has decided those different combinations of status and data bytes mean. So those first two, the most common, obviously notes being turned on, notes being turned off, and then it just goes down the line. It's like 128 different, different sort of uh, messages. So there's an example of a MIDI, a MIDI signal as you would see it written in documentation. We have three bytes. The first three numbers of that status signal tell us that it's a, uh, a, a note that's being played on. The second one tells us that it's a, it maps to note number 60 in the, uh, in, uh, as a MIDI message, which correlates to middle C on a keyboard. And the last one tells me I'm playing it with full velocity, which means I'm hitting it really, really hard. Uh, as far as that translates to the standard, I've sort of in pseudocode like outlined what it does there. And like I said earlier though, you don't exactly need to know any of this to play with it at the end of the day. When you get it in JavaScript and you're playing around with these controllers, you just get an array with three numbers. <laughs> and so you can kind of ignore everything I just said and know that when I push this button, I'm gonna get three numbers. And so let me just demonstrate that really quick. So basically what I have here is I just have a little um, sort of playground I've set up to play with different MIDI controllers and listen to the different uh, signals are coming in and out as I'm playing with it. So I've got this keyboard up here. I'm just going to hit this note up here and see what happens. Okay. And so if I hold this down, we can see at the very top, I've got, I've got three numbers. I've got 144, 48, and 106. As that maps to the, the MIDI standard, that's not middle C, but it's a little bit lower than middle C. Um, the 106 tells me I'm not hitting it very hard. If I hit a little bit harder, you get 110. And 144 tells me that, I'm, that the node is on. Uh, this particular demo will come back in a second because I'll explain how a lot of MIDI controllers are not terribly well documented. And if you have something that is less straightforward than say a piano or a keyboard, it might be kind of tricky to figure out what's going on. And so I pull this thing up and I just start hitting buttons. And I start paying attention to what the numbers look like and then eventually you start to see some kind of logic form here. Okay. So what does using JavaScript in MIDI look like? Um, it actually does Terribly dissimilar to other sort of permissions-based things you do in the browser, like asking for location, asking for the uh, the webcam, things like that. You you make a request and request and uh, access is actually granted by default. You don't have to approve MIDI access for most pages unless you're asking for it in a very particular way that isn't worth going into here. Um, but if you wanted to disable MIDI access on all websites you go to, there's a setting for that in Chrome. I've never felt a need to do that, but I'm glad that it's there. Um, so the code looks like this. It's not terribly dissimilar. Like I said, you just, you ask, you make a request to access it, uh, it returns a promise, and then depending on whether or not that succeeds or fails, you now have a MIDI access object that lets you know all of the inputs and outputs that you can start playing with and sending and receiving messages from. It's really straightforward. Um, this is like sort of a pseudocode example of how I iterate through all the controllers I have plugged in up here. I've got about six or seven, and so I, sort of map through these and, and figure out what's sort of nice is the, the actual name of the controllers is usually included by the hardware manufacturer. So you can discern a little bit more easily what you have plugged in if you have a setup kind of like this. It's nice if there's just having like an array from like one, zero to six or something and you'd be guessing all day. Um, handling a received message kind of looks like this. You get an event and inside that event you have a data attribute and that data attribute is just an array of three numbers. And so in this particular example, I'm just checking to see if the first byte is a note on message, 144. And the second one, I'm checking to see if it's middle C. And the third one, I'm checking to see if I hit it really hard. And if I did, then I can do something. Yeah, that's what I just said. Um, there are some libraries out there that make this interaction pretty easy. It's pretty straightforward to do it in native JavaScript, but if you want to, uh, webmini.js is a really good one. It, instead of just playing with the numbers and mapping those to whatever you like, it um, actually translates the events. So instead of listening for you know, message number 144, um, I can actually say, hey, I want to listen for a note on event or a note off event, or I want to listen for all of the events and discern later which ones they were. You're doing a more musical kind of application. Um, it makes sense. It's probably a little more straightforward and probably easier to read later here. 
And then midi-utils.js is just a good way of translating these numbers into musical notes, if you're trying to do something like that, or translating those musical notes into frequencies if you want to play with web audio and do some interesting interactive things there. That's it. As far as like interacting with MIDI and JavaScript, that's really all you need to know. You, you ask for permission, you get the callback, you listen for messages, and you get an array with three numbers. So, I mean, that's not that interesting by itself. Um, so we're going to cut to the demos here in a second. Um, you can also do, uh, it's also worth mentioning real quickly, you can do it with server-side JavaScript. You can do it in Node, obviously. Um, and the only things that are different there, and it's very similar, but we don't need to request permission, obviously. Um, latency, can be, latency can be an issue depending on what kind of an application you're making. And uh, working with MIDI files is generally a lot easier if you're doing stuff in Node, because um, we have like hardware-level access to whatever we're doing in that situation. Yeah, we can do more interesting system-level things. And requesting uh, MIDI and Node looks kind of like this. Very similar. Yeah, got examples, I want to look at those later. So I'm going to cut to the demos. Um, the, talk, the, the name of this talk is More Than Music with MIDI, and I want to explore those. But my first couple demos are music-oriented, so I just wanted to demo those. Um, Oh yeah, so the first demo I already showed you, but often when I get a new, new MIDI controller and the documentation might be subpar, like if I buy it on AliExpress or something like that and it just shows up in a box, uh, I like to plug it into here and I just start hitting buttons, as ridiculous as it sounds, and I try to just make sense of that. And eventually, you can kind of map that to some kind of logic. So right now I'm turning a dial, and I can see, oh, okay, so 176 refers to must return to some sort of like control signal. One might be the specific dial, because there's eight of them up here. And that right one is clearly like the value of the dial as I turn it up and down. So sometimes you have to sit down and do that, as ridiculous as it sounds. That's not an interesting demo. Let's do a more fun one. OK, so here's a really simple synthesizer that we can make. Um, Pretty straightforward. Let's go on. There's probably some more interesting ones. Uh, using MIDI hardware to manipulate web audio is actually a really interesting way to explore interactions. Um, you know, a lot of like DJs do stuff like this, but let's see here. So if I hit one of these guys, it should trigger a sound. Let me hit this one. <laughs> Let me trigger a different one. That's a slightly better one. Okay, so now I've got web audio. Uh, I'm using web audio to create this visualization in the background. I'm using the MIDI controller to trigger different samples. And now I can use these little dials here to start manipulating the audio in fun ways here. I can play with the pitch. I can play with the speed. I mean, obviously, web audio is doing the heavy lifting, but the using MIDI and JavaScript allowed me to create an interesting way to interface with this, like in the real world. All right, there's another audio demo. And this is the one that didn't work in the beginning. Again, we can try this later if you like. Let me skip this one. Okay, so the, let's explore, this is the, the fun stuff. So I wanna demo some of the non-musical examples of MIDI, because at the end of the day, MIDI is just a, like I said, it's just three numbers that your hardware and your computer send back and forth to communicate with another. You can kind of decide what that means, and I think that's really fun and kind of interesting. Um, so one of the things I built is I built a, a simple color mixer uh, using this same little controller I have up here, which I'll show you in a second. So I can turn these dials, and it's kind of hard to see because it's like, there we go, now it's red. And I can, so I'm mixing my red now. I'm going to mix a little bit of, uh, a little bit of green in there, like that kind of color, and just to sort of demonstrate what I'm doing there. Yeah, I'm just turning these dials down here to mix my different colors, and I'm using these buttons over here, just like whether it's red, green, or blue. Kind of a simple thing. This one, so this is actually the first interaction. 
active JavaScript MIDI thing I made. I play in a little duo back home, and we wanted to create some sort of like interactive display behind us while we played, like some sort of artsy thing. We thought it'd be fun. And after a lot of exploration, I accidentally discovered that I could interact with MIDI and JavaScript and have it do things beyond just triggering samples and manipulating audio and doing all that stuff. I could have it do pretty much anything. So I made a little web page that would take a, basically it was a random poetry generator. It would take a random video, an old black and white video with the audio stripped, and generate random poems on top of it, like a really sort of artsy, weird little thing. And we would trigger it with this little controller I have down here on the stage. I would just hit buttons every once in a while and have different poems and things show up behind us. Um, and I'm gonna demo it real quick because honestly, I really, I really enjoy this one. This was, this is the first project I did that really made me think, hey, we can use MIDI to make a lot of curious, interactive things. It doesn't have to be limited to like a music-specific application. Let's see here. So I click, should be on. I hit one. Sometimes the poems are better than others. <laughs> Let's see if we got a video. No. Okay, we got something. We get a different poem. And then for the sake of this demo, I added a third button that just lets me trigger some random audio. Do one more. <laughs> it's kind of, I actually, I could actually stare at this all day. I think it's really it's kind of interesting. I'll explain how it was made in a second, but it's funny because it sort of, it sort of accidentally creates meeting every once in a while. Like, it's, it's weird. Man. Anyway, so we just had this playing behind us while we play music, and it was, it was kind of a fun thing. So what's going on there, just to explain real quick, is it takes a random video from archive.org. They have a lot of great, like, uh, public domain things there. Um, it takes a random book from Gutenberg.org, and it basically pulls out three sentences, or four random sentences from that book, one for the title, and then three others just kind of at random. And what's interesting is, like, if you take random sentences from the same book, you will accidentally, you know, it's always in the same author's voice, usually. You get a lot of the same characters showing up. So you get weirdly, like, self-relevant things. It's kind of interesting how that is. Anyway, I like that one. I just wanted to show that. Uh, so here's another example. <laughs> My brain works in weird ways. Uh, who's, who's familiar with the Goonies? Okay. It's funny, I did this talk two weeks ago in Ukraine, and I asked that, and zero hands went up. Because I realized in that moment that, oh, you know what, the Goonies is a very, like, American-specific, like, pop cultural reference. <laughs> and I, so I had to explain what the Goonies was in, like, two minutes, and it was kind of funny. I wasn't anticipating that. So there's a scene in that movie where they play an organ to escape from these bad guys who are chasing them. They, it's, they're basically stuck in this place with booby traps. I can just show you these photos. They get this organ like this, and they have to play the right chords to make a door open and escape from the bad guys, basically. I was thinking about that scene, and I thought, could we actually like build that in the real world using MIDI? And could we build something like that? And so I kind of did. I made, I made this little guy, <laughs> which, oh, I can't read that. What is it? Uh, hmm. D sharp, D sharp, D sharp, and E? Okay. Oh, I missed it. C sharp, D, and G. Let's see. C sharp. Uh, yeah, let's see. Oh, this is awful. Man, that sounds terrible. <laughs> F, wait, A, F, A, A sharp, D sharp. Maybe I have to be, let's see. I have to be in the right register, and I'm actually forgetting what register I just set this to. That's too bad. Anyway, when I do hit the chord right, let's see, D, D, F sharp, G. I give up. Anyway, it did work last time. <laughs> <laughs> I made a silly thing that if you hit the chords in the right way, you actually win the silly little game I made. And I thought, okay, that's like the proof of concept level. Like, that's what I'm trying to accomplish. I just need to, you know, actually plug it into, like, hardware, which I'm sad to say I haven't done yet. <laughs> but it's on my list. And if you go on YouTube out there, 
you can find videos of people syncing MIDI signals to step motors and, and hardware and interactive things like this. And I realized, you know, if I really wanted to put like a weekend into it or like four weekends, I could probably build something that's like the Goonies organ where you play the right chord and a door opens or something like that. And this is sort of where my mind goes when I try to think of like non-musical applications for, for MIDI, goofy things like that. And here's another demo, but I'll skip through because I know I'm starting to run a little bit long here. Um, I will try to skip ahead. So I have one where I play the CSS filters, which is kind of interesting. You can actually explore like two parameters at once, which is kind of fun. Let's see, I have to do the program change to this one. There we go. So if I want to play with the CPA level, I want to play with the hue rotate. And so I can turn, the, because of the asynchronous nature of JavaScript, I can turn in multiple ones at the same time and kind of blend things like that. And I don't know how practical this is. <laughs> what's interesting, <laughs> but what's kind of fun is like I had another demo that I didn't set up for this because it doesn't look as fun, where I'm trying to control all of the different parameters I can on, a, on an object using these interfaces. And you know, like I said, I don't know if it's like practical or applicable, but it gets me thinking about these things in a slightly different way. Um, let's, let me skip through to the next one here. Let's see. We got here, oh, drawing a simple image. This one's actually probably worth doing. So I've got some more interesting controllers up here. Let's see here. Now I realize you can't see what I'm doing, but I'll show you in a minute here. There we go. And so now if I skip to this guy, you can see basically I have a very simple way to draw a little eight by eight bitmap image or something like that. <laughs> so if I were to, for example, build my own MIDI controller and make it you know, many more uh, squares by many more squares, I could have a more interesting way to doodle and draw things. Um, oh, this one's more interesting. This is a, another color mixer, but instead of, oh, I turned that off, didn't I? Oh, there we go. So, but instead of using the dials and things, I've got it mapped to that accelerometer I was talking about earlier. And so now I have a way of like actually just physically moving in the space and interacting with the colors. It's kind of fun. It's a good way, to, it's like instant carpal tunnel if you want to like try to get certain colors. <laughs> And if I see something I like, I can just click on this guy and it'll, it'll make a little CSS, uh, it'll spit out the color in a ready to use CSS class for me, which is kind of fun. So, you know, if you get tired of like mixing hex numbers and like trying to eyeball hex codes and things, maybe you could just plug this in and try it. You know, anything that's you thinking a little bit outside the box, I think is kind of fun. And then I can switch to HSL, which is really fun because if I hold my hand straight out like that, it's white. I feel like there's more interesting things I could do with this one that I haven't quite figured out yet. Anyway. And then the other thing I like to do is I, I, uh, I find myself making games. I feel like making games is a really good way to explore uh, some of these concepts. You know, it's interesting that like the, the trend for the last couple of years towards like stateful web applications on the front end, like kind of mirrors what game design has done for a very long time. And there's something about like designing things as though they were a game that makes, at least forces me to be much more thorough with the way I design things and implement them. And so I started making little games using these MIDI controllers. I made one where I just take the same color thing, but I try to match the color, you know? It's kind of a, some of them are like harder to match than, oh, got that one. Some of them are harder to match than others. Anyway, you get the idea. Usually I end up cheating, I just like take this off and I go like this. See if I can eventually get it. <laughs> Sometimes it works. Yes, that worked. <laughs> oh, no, it didn't. Anyway. Um, I made witty uh, MIDI whack-a-mole. Again, I was looking at this little uh, 8 by 8 pad interface down here, and I was trying to think of other games I could implement, and I thought of like the whack-a-mole game at the arcade for some reason, so I made this little guy. Um, let's see here. Oh, I'm terrible at this, do you want? Oh, we're on, a, we're on a wireless HDMI, so there's like a delay too. That's like really not, this is not gonna work. Oh well. 
Anyway, just to sort of demo though, uh, you know, what's interesting about that one though is I can, um, you know, because of the velocity uh, that I can detect on this thing, I could actually add a component where I, where it says confidence down there. And so it's like, how confident are you whacking these moles? Was my thought. <laughs> and, so like, <laughs> and so that was like kind of a fun thing to build. And I, I know I'm going way over, so I will skip ahead here. I apologize. Okay, so we can see, not that one, but this one. And so one of the very first programs I made when I was like 10 years old is I made a ball bounce around on the screen. And for whatever reason, that's like my go-to, like, that's like my version of Hello World, especially when I'm working with something visual. I want to make a ball bounce on the screen. And so I, I made this, which is like, you know, normal DJ equipment, and I can tap that to start a little ball bouncing on the screen. It's like, oh, well, it's like upside down the way you're looking at it, I realize, but there we go kind of fun, and then I can add another one, and now they start interacting with one another when they get in touch. It's kind of a fun, non-musical demo to try to build. <laughs> okay. um, this one, I, I'm just going to jump straight to the last one, I'm sorry. Um, and then the most interesting one that I made was, who plays Go, the game Go here? A few people, it's, it's a good nerd game. I feel like there's usually some people. Okay, so I was trying to think what I could make with an eight by eight board, and I thought I could make checkers, and I could make chess, and I thought, well, I could make like sort of a tinier version of Go. That might be an interesting thing. And so that's what I did. I used this launch pad, and I found an existing Go project out there, um, which is really fabulous, called Tanuki. And what I like about this one Oops. So now I've got a functional eight by eight game of Go that we can play. And I'm terrible at Go, so give me a minute here to do this. Okay. Okay. Yeah, there we go. So you can. And what I like about this demo is because this particular library that I found works on the front end and it also works on the server side. Uh, in combination with those tiny computers I was talking about earlier, I, I have like a standalone version of this that I could theoretically bring to parties, like very lame parties, I suppose. But <laughs> <laughs> so I now have my digital Go on its own little computer, powered by like a battery that I can bring to parties, and you know, uh, so these are the sort of things I end up making. Like I said, really, really useful, practical things you guys can use. Let's see. <laughs> Basically, someone has repurposed these things to create a giant interactive musical instrument. Um, they're, they're huge, and it's a lot of fun. I was there that day, and we organized kids, and we started playing like Twinkle Twinkle and things like that. It was great. And these are the sort of things I love. I love when people take something that was, in this case, like not intended for music at all and completely repurposed. It shows a type of creativity and just outside-the-box thinking that I think is I mean, not only fun and pleasant and enjoyable, but I think it actually makes us better developers to like take time to explore and have fun and play, basically. Um, you know, take a break from whatever we're doing from work and do something that uses a slightly different part of our brain. I have a demo of what that sounds like. So that's the end of my talk. Thank you guys for bearing with some of that. <laughs>